And now I'm really happy to, um, to welcome our first external partner, Dr. Theo Steiniger, um, CEO of Aerium. So Theo Steiniger will tell us, um, give us a first brief uh, overview about um, artificial intelligence in industrial applications. I think this is a very important step to really bring this new trending technology um, into the industry. And I already learned in the preparation that some challenges are waiting there for all of us. And uh, I'm happy to learn more about that uh, in, in the next minutes. And I hope, Theo, that you are there now. Yeah, you should see and hear me now. Perfect, Theo. Welcome on the virtual stage. It's great to have you with us. Perhaps you start with a short introduction. Virtual stage is yours. Talk to you later. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me here. My name is Theo Steininger. I'm the CEO of Irium. We are a small AI startup from Munich. And um, I'm really happy that you have uh, invited me to be here at the Harting Ethernet Week 2022. And I'd like to discuss with you today the topic of artificial intelligence in industrial application potential and use cases. And before we have a deep dive on solutions and um, technical applications, I have to show you some numbers. First, I don't know if you knew, but actually there is a Bitcom study that uh, tells us that roughly 70% of managers in Germany say that they really need AI to um, remain on the competitive edge in their business, but only 8% succeed in implementing AI. And this is even worse if you look at the specific numbers with regards to specific projects. There, 98% of data science projects actually fail. So what does fail in this context mean? With fail, I mean that a data science project failed if it did not create business value in the end. And if you look at the specific numbers, you see that 85% of the projects did not even make it to the finish line. And from those 15% of the projects that got finished, only 2% in total create business value in the end. And those numbers show how yeah, AI in the, um, uh, in, 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 in the public advertisement is pushed and is hyped, but the reality check shows that there is a big problem converting the potential into actually business value. And I'd like to discuss with you within the next minutes, what are the reasons for that and how to overcome this. But before we do so, I also would like to tell you a little bit more about the technology of AI and machine learning itself. And there the confusion even begins. So if you hear in the uh, news, if you read an article, AI, machine learning, um, maybe advanced statistics, analytics, you might ask yourself, what's the difference? And AI is like the result. Artificial intelligence, for me, in, in a very common definition, is the result that you enable a machine to do something that is more or less intelligent. And the key tool to achieve this goal is machine learning. And machine learning is a fancy term for advanced statistics, you could say. And with some exceptions, you can take um, this message with you at home that in general, you can put all those algorithms that you make and find on, on Wikipedia into one of those three categories, clustering, regression, and reinforcement learning. And by this, you can be um, comforted that if there is a guy telling you, okay, there's this new fancy algorithm, the probability is quite high that it in fact is just another variant of clustering, regression, and reinforcement learning. So what does this mean? Let's have a closer look. First, clustering. What is clustering good for? Clustering means that you have a set of data points in a data space and you'd like to find some structure by grouping those data points together in, group, in groups that are similar to each other. And usually similarity is defined by um, being close together. And uh, a usual use case you could use this for is credit card fraud detection. So in this example that I've painted on the, on the slide here, you have only two dimensions. The one is you've got a transaction 
and um, on the vertical axis you can read off like what is the transactional volume was it like only like one euro or like 10,000 euros and um, on the horizontal axis you can read the daytime of the transaction and this is just an example that I made up but there a possible use case could be that if there is a high volume transaction at 2 a.m. at night that might not be realistic that you just bought a new flat screen and a sound system but that this might be credit card fraud in fact and what you can see here already is that you need rather little knowledge to do an analysis this is the big pro the modeling effort is rather low but the downside is that those algorithms are um yeah pretty pretty well known for having high rates of false alarms because they know so little about the system they are analyzing so this is like the same thing but two sides of one coin um, if you have low modeling effort, the algorithm cannot know very much about the system it analyzes. The second approach that um, you usually use in machine learning is the one of regression, like the second category. There you uh, try to find some structure in the parameter space by um, fitting a curve, and a curve can also be straight, like the straight line here, to a set of data points. And by this, you'd like to interpolate and extrapolate from a training data set. Again, an example. Here, predictive maintenance for pumps. If you have, from an historic analysis, information about what is the wear and tear situation of a ball bearing in your pump, and the energy consumption the pump had when it had the uh, state of wear and tear, then you can, only with the information about the energy, extrapolate, okay, what is the current state of the pump and what could it be, how could it evolve in the next um, minutes, hours or days. And by this technology, you can enable predictive maintenance use cases. The downside, okay, you get already um, uh, predictions that are more precise than only uh, coming from an anom anomaly detection or like a clustering algorithm, but it does not really give an answer on what is the reason for a problem. So you only get like correlation out of this. The third category of algorithms that I'd like to mention is reinforcement learning. Pretty cool term. This uh, topic is very, very powerful, yet still in um, academic research for the most applications. Why? What is this about? In reinforcement learning, you have a setup like painted on the slide on the right hand side. You've got an environment and this environment gives reward in positive terms or it punishes an agent and this agent can be for example a robot a picking robot and this agent interacts with the environment for example the robot tries to pick a part from a box without knowing how to do this exactly and if it is successful the system is set up that way that the agent gets a reward from the environment and by observing the environment and checking did I get a reward or not, the agent, the robot, can adapt its strategy on how to grab a part, how to pick it, in order to become better and better. But there you already see you need a lot of trials to make progress. As a child tries 1,000 times to make one single step successfully, also this agent, the picking robot, has to conduct a lot of trials. So therefore, you, you must be in a situation that you can afford putting a robot there and letting it be for days and weeks to get to get a training um, uh, completed. But on the, on, on the, on the um, pro side, this system is super flexible. So you can solve a lot of um, tasks with it where you're not able to define what is the right strategy for my, my agent, my system to solve this problem actually. And now I gave you like three slides of information that you've seen in the past already like this or uh, similar and I'm sure every one of you now knows okay now I'm gonna use machine learning and AI in my business for use case one two three no rather not because that's actually the problem the main challenge in AI and machine learning in the industry is not the algorithm that data precision um, in the model in the end is not good enough. The problem is that you first of all have to get an answer to the question, what's actually my problem?
And this is something that we had to learn as an AI startup by ourselves because, you know, Maxime, my co-founder and I, we both have a PhD in astrophysics. We know software engineering, we know numerics, and then we started doing our first industry projects. And then we realized, okay, the models are only a small part of the problem. It's more about the workflow that really is determining if you're part of the 8% that are successful or like part of the 92% that fail implementing AI in your company. And what have we seen in the past? In the past, we experienced the following. Companies try to bring AI into their processes and their culture by just hiring data scientists. And they are rare, but with maybe enough money, enough perks, you get them in your team. So then you have your data scientist in the company and maybe um, even a team of data scientists. And you do everything, right? You conduct workshops, you have brainstorming sessions, you um, have uh, rapid POCs. You do all this, but still you will end up, if you're not very, very careful, in a, in a situation where AI does not scale because you set up processes like the one shown on the right hand side on the slide, a workflow where everything is centered around the data scientist. And in the end then, the data scientist only does little modeling and training and statistics, what she or he is trained for, and a lot of communication. You have to create reports for management. You have to interact with the domain experts, understand what is the process actually that I'm um, working on, where does the data come from? So very, very important step in, in a machine learning project to understand where does the data come from. So you have to discuss a lot with the domain expert. Um, then you have to get some access to data. So you have interactions with the database admin. And in a classical scenario where you just put a data scientist in your office, um, you will end up in this non-scalable workflow where everything has to go through this bottleneck data scientist. And even if you find a data scientist who is willing and able to handle all this, you will always have the bottleneck of hiring in the end too. So um, this does not work on so many levels. I cannot even emphasize. From our experience, there is something to do um, that is known for years, for ages, that helps you out of this pity. And this is establishing scalable workflows that turn all the stakeholders actually into co-creators. And what I've shown here on the right is the good old CRISP DM cycle. It's uh, uh, a workflow defined, I don't even know how old it is, um, uh, ages, it comes from the first first years of data analytics, and it it it, it super um, easily specifies what are the stages of an analytics project, and let's have a look at that. So first, you start with business understanding, going back and forth to data understanding, then going into the next step of data preparation. Then you do some modeling and training. Then you evaluate the results, and if you're satisfied with your solution with a model that you created, you can go into deployment. And if not, you, you start over again. And most of the companies I talk to say, yeah, yeah, we are working um, according to CRISPM or one of the new cycles um, that might include also um, uh, data privacy departments. Those are details, but in the end, what they really do is they work like that and they tell their data scientist, now you're responsible for all those steps. Good luck with it. How to establish such a workflow? We can have a look at in one second. Let's have a break with theory. Let's have a look at some specific use cases. The initial project actually that um, caused us to Fund, uh, found uh, Erium was a project that we conducted together with BMW and Dingolfing. So what was the problem there? Yeah, you might have seen the I next on the streets already. And um, what's very characteristic for uh, electric vehicles is that more and more carbon parts are used for the car body. But carbon has a 
huge downside. Okay, it's very uh, light. That's a good thing. But the downside is carbon cannot be bent. And if you cannot bend carbon, your options for correcting the position of, for example, a door are very limited. And this is exactly uh, the problem that BMW had. So the question was, how can we even faster adapt the mounting position of our doors so that the um, rework effort in the end is minimized as much as possible because the rework of carbon parts is so hard. And so why is this even a problem? Thereby you have to understand that if you have to install a door, this is in the very beginning of the mounting process. So there is no window in there, there is no interior. You don't even have paint on the door because like the car body side of the hinge has to be painted too. Have a look when you enter your car the next time. And therefore, you have the situation that you have to um, fix the position of the door in a super early state, but a lot of things happen to the door. It gets painted, heated up, you've got the ceiling band, you have all the interior that deforms the door, but also adds just weight. And the question was, can we use the measurement data BMW has in the car body process, in the manufacturing process, to predict on the one hand side, if I mount the door like this and that, what will be the situation, the position in the end? And can we turn this around? So if we'd like to reach a certain position, what is the optimal mounting position that we have the robot, uh, that we have to give the robot? And um, the it, BMW approached us. We did mathematical modeling to tackle this problem. And in the end, with this mathematical modeling, we were able to first include CAD data. So we really know where does the data come from. And we were able to model the um, uh, causes and effects within the process. And now BMW is able to feed the car mounting robot with the exact positions that optimize the car door position in the end. Thereby, I really like to emphasize the key to success was the mathematical modeling of knowledge the engineers had and gathered um, over the last decades in their work. First, we too tried to apply a black box machine learning model, but this did not work. It was not robust enough. It was not transparent enough. It um, was too slow in training. So it did not meet real world um, uh, demands to be used in, in production. A second use case that we conducted um, was done in the field of 3D printing together with Meissner. And Meissner had a cool idea. Meissner produces big parts um, for, for um, aluminum casting. And they had the idea, okay, instead of taking a huge block of steel and grind everything layer for layer out of this huge block, let's use a 3D printer to create a form that roughly meets the dimensions and then only do the fine uh, uh, milling to get the final form. The only problem was the 3D printers that you can buy on the market, they try to meet the, 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 the target form immediately and thereby are very limited in terms of mass throughput and size uh, of, of, of parts that you can print. And the cool thing was then, very startup approach, Meister said, okay, then let's build this 3D printer by on our own. They bought some lasers, they got um, all the, uh, uh, all the automation uh, parts to uh, bring the powder from A to B. And in principle, they had a working 3D printer. But there was one problem, the right parameter set, how to, again, uh, control this robot, it wasn't known. Because if you're not super careful, the quality of your printed, of your printed part is not sufficient. And together with Meissner, we did the following. We created, again, a machine learning model that took into account all the know-how and all the learnings the engineers made so far in the project. And with this, doing like a, a design of experiments on steroids, 
we found working parameters within a sprint of one week compared to like a trial and error parameter optimization um, approach Meissner did without us before over half a year. A third use case that is um, uh, worth mentioning is a use case that we conducted together with Festo. So the first two use cases were like, okay, we'd like to control our, an automated um, setup. We'd like to optimize parameters in an automated setup. The project that we conducted together with Festo was more like this finding the root cause of problems. And what here um, can be seen is a new product line by Festo with very, very cool valves that can be controlled via software. And to do this, this wolf has a lot of components being combined in a very little space. Um, they give you flexibility like piezos and, and springs um, that makes it difficult to actually uh, assemble this part. And in the end, uh, Festo ended up in a situation that the, um, that the, 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 the rate of faulty products they produced was too high and was even the number one um, uh, cost factor in the production, although this wolf was a pre-series product. So they had to find what is the reason for not okay parts. And what we did here is, again, sit down together with the engineers and model everything that we know about the um, assembly process and how this wolf works internally. And with this, we found out, okay, First, you don't only have a problem within your assembly line, you also have a problem with your testers. Because what we found is that there was correlation between testing results within one tester, but between two valves that must be uncorrelated by design, but they were correlated. So this was the first thing, the first homework that we gave Festo, hey, check your testers because the data that you're capturing cannot be correct. And then we, like from a logical point of view, we went back in the process into the actual assembly and that identified parameters they were tuning, not even having an effect on the assembly line. And um, what they actually were seeing was noise from an unstable process. And because the system, this assembly line was so complex, you were not able as a human to see this just visualizing the data. You really had to formulate hypothesis and then check are those hypotheses true or false with the aid of advanced statistics. And I'd like to summarize what we learned from those use cases in like the learnings from an AI startup. And the most important thing is data. It's the start. It's not the only thing, but it's the foundation to phrase it like that. And I'd like to make this more specific. So what you can see here on the slide is a scheme of a paint shop. And um, the scheme um, was, was used to understand what is the data structure in this paint shop, again, with the goal, minimize not okay parts that are coming out of this paint shop. And we had fun time, <laughs> not really, to prepare the data to bring it in a form that we can do statistics with it. And only within the project, we understood why it is such a huge amount of work to prepare the data. The reason for that is that, okay, you have got PLCs in your, in your paint shop, but they are not meant to collect data for the purpose of statistical analysis. Because what they do, if you've got a conveyor belt here, and there is a PLC attached to it controlling this conveyor belt, it does the job of controlling the conveyor belt. And it does not care about, for example, synchronized timestamps. And what we've seen then in the data was, okay, if we look at the time a part needs to go through this paint shop, we have this, this weird zigzag effect in the data. So the, the amount of time the parts need seem to increase, increase, increase. And then there was like a reset point in, in, in time. And it, then it reset it again. And we, we've seen in the data that, okay, wait a second, this reset point, that school vacation. So what happened here is when there was like a school vacation, the big maintenances were planned. 
And what they did is they restarted the PLCs and with restart, the PLCs got the correct time from the NTP service and uh, we're in sync again. But then time drift started and in the end corrupted the data. And um, in, a, in, a, in the next step, we had the problem that the identifiers had to be matched from station A to station B. So we needed translation tables and so on and so forth. By the way, the same with BMW. I learned that a car has more than four serial numbers until it is finally um, manufactured. And you have to match those individual data silos. So those legacy data structures, they collect or they may collect a lot of data. You may connect them to a data lake, but this does not mean that the data is suitable for analytics because it in the first place often was never meant to be used for analytics. Then you have to have the metadata. What is even um, uh, the right um, the right unit? Is it Fahrenheit, Kelvin, or Celsius, or is it something completely randomly offset? Because only 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 the slope of the temperature increase or decrease was important for the PLC. Information like that is so important for statistics that it only can emphasize what we've heard uh, in in the talk before by by Mr. Finke that OPC UA companion specs, asset administration shell, are the key tools to use to add semantic understanding about what is the data all about. And now you've got still the problem of, okay, now I've got data and I might have hired a data scientist. You still have the problem of setting up a process, a workflow within your company that really, I can only repeat, turns all the stakeholders into co-creators. And I don't know if this is the only solution or if this is the best solution, but at least this is what we are working on for more than three years now. It is an integrated platform where all those stakeholders can collaborate. We call this thingy Helirium. And you don't have to use it. You may set up something by your own with a Miro, Jupyter Notebooks, you name it. But this is like one unified approach that we are doing. And I'd like to explain the components of the solution so you can understand what, from our perspective, was important to bring to one table. And to really make this clear, you can also do this with pen and paper, if you like, if this suits your company best. But we chose the platform, the platform approach. So what you have here is on the one hand side, you need, besides the data, you need computing power. So what we introduced here on the left-hand side is the possibility to utilize computing power from the cloud because nothing is more annoying than having a use case ready, having the data, and then not being able to train the model because my laptop does not have the proper GPU. So this is one very important uh, aspect being able to utilize the power clouds provide me also without the effort of setting up everything over weeks and weeks and weeks, because we must not forget data scientists are different than um, uh, ML ops engineers, totally different fields of, of work. Then on the uh, extreme opposite, we have introduced a knowledge board for understanding and structuring problems and turning small pieces of information to a big picture. This is where collaboration with domain experts and management happens to really understand what is the business value of this use case. How do we measure success? Not ending up in those 85% of stopped projects not being successful, not adding any business value to the company. And of course, we have to do some prototyping. So. You have to give your data scientists the opportunity and the, the, the chance to produce actual code. And now, very important ingredient is to link those two worlds together. Because you must not forget in the psyche, you have to do many iterations to be successful. Before we jump back to the, to the cycle, um, for completeness, what we also introduced here is a library that allows you to model um, industrial processes very conveniently in terms of the statistics that we did back on the, um, 
back in the days at Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. This is what we call inference, Helium inference. And with this solution, we've seen great successes to really turn the stakeholders into co-creators in your company. And this is what I really like to emphasize. Don't care much about what is the actual model that you're using. Don't care much about do we have like 1,000 or 1,100 data points to this problem. Turn every stakeholder into a co-creator because only then you are able to eliminate the data scientist as a bottleneck and you really end up utilizing machine learning and becoming one company of those 92% of the success uh, to become one of the 8% successful companies in the market out there. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the Hutting Industrial Ethernet Week. And if you've got question, just drop me a message or ask right now. Thank you very much, Theo. That was, that was great, interesting. And for me, it looks like that uh, there are challenges to overcome, but with getting co-creations with like ecosystems and partnerships, we are able to, to overcome those, um, those challenges. And also for sure from our side, congratulations to the, uh, to the shared success stories and uh, that you, that you overjumped the challenges you were facing in those projects. This is really uh, tremendously um, a cool story you, you have to show there. And um, I really, I received one, one particular question um, at the end there, um, which could be probably important also for the rest of the week here for us. I mean, um, you said that up to 85% of the, uh, of the project started are failing and, and you, you um, touched a couple of points, why is that? But um, the major question is if they are all failing, is the data, uh, let's say, missing or is the, the data too bad, which we are able to gather from the yeah, shop floor in our world here? Or what is the reason? Can you, can you just like go into a little bit more details regarding that, please? Yeah, let me jump back to the slide so everyone knows what we are talking about. So you're referring to this slide, right? Um, yes. The number one reason for those 85 five percent of failed projects is definitely data because you have problems on various levels you might not even know which data you have or you could have um, you might have access to the data but it might be um, non-calibrated non-understandable you had a maintenance cycle in the, in the past you uh, changed a sensor in your manufacturing line you don't know hmm. So you cannot feed this data, this um, this 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 uh, heterogeneous data to your algorithm anymore. Those are reasons why you end up in those eighty-five percent. And I have to add one thing. So it's normal to have trial and error. So if you if you say, okay, first of all, we have to do some some trials. We have to conduct some POCs to 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 get also get a feeling what might be a successful use case what might be a use case that not fits our company. That's true. But what I still see is that way too many resources are invested into projects before they get stopped, right? And if you go through the crisp GM cycle as one example, um, quickly enough and often enough, you can stop projects very, very early on. And okay, even if you might have to end up in, in like a failed project, you do so with only very little resources spent. Great, thank you. So, interesting journey, I, I guess we all uh, will we'll see during the next years and uh, shows also to me that uh, the industrial transformation is probably not a sprint, but more a long distance run. And um, I'm happy to see also in Germany some, some startups popping up in, in your way to, to, to make even better what we are good in an in industry. So, thank you, Theo, for joining us. Uh, thank you for your offer to answer questions uh, afterwards. Um, it was great to have you with us and uh, talk to you soon, hopefully, or meet in person one day uh, when we are talking different times. Thank you, Theo. And to all of so, you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Theo. Bye. And to all of you outside Bye. there, we, um, we have our first break now. So I think it's time for, for, for coffee or for getting a drink. And um, it would be um, very nice if you come back to us here at 11. Um, when we will um, welcome our next external guests here um, from the companies KUKA, ZIK, 
and uh, B and R um, to have a panel talk um, on the stage here. Um, how seamless sensor to cloud communication can be boosted then, then because we just learned this seems to be important to make industry 4.0 integrated industry working. So see you at 11 German time here on stage again. Thank you. <laughs>